Okay, so for the next hour, what David and I are, are going to talk about are um, something that we all have to live through, unfortunately, and that's audits and kind of figure out a strategy of when you want to litigate, when you want to settle, when you just want to wave the white flag and pay it. Um, and those days do happen, trust me. Um, so a lot of what we're going to talk about, I think, should either be standard operating procedures, either for you or your clients. And I will say, when I was in-house, um, the goal was to successfully resolve matters. And successful is obviously in the eye of the beholder. And, um, and, and management's idea of successful is not always my idea of successful. Uh, but so basically, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. But you got to look, you get audited, you got to pick your cases. You got to pick your issues and figure out where you're going to go. Not everything should be litigated. Not everything, you know, get the audit over with, get the guy out as fast as you can before he finds what he hasn't found. And, and so we really do need to kind of work through that. Um, so while you may not want to litigate a case, and my partners may shoot me when I say this, I will tell you both my in-house and now my experience doing this, most tax cases should not be litigated. They really should. Bad facts make bad law. But having said that, you never tip your hand that you're not going to litigate it. You should head out and start everything like it's going to the US Supreme Court. And I realize it sounds silly, but it's not. Because if you don't do that, if you don't take it seriously, something's going to jump up and bite you. There is no doubt in my mind. I've got plenty of experience of this. Something's going to jump up and bite you. So with that being said, here's our agenda. Maybe you can jump in here. Yeah, I'll add that. So we just listened to Chris and Samantha's presentation. And I think on the sales tax side, they only had one victory of all those cases. So that's that just goes to show you that's a lot of losers that went through the litigation and spent a lot of money. Now, I think Marilyn will also tell you, Marilyn and I work together a lot, and she knows that um I, I, I will push her on things about litigating because I think you have to find that balance. There and are times polite to say in the, in the back that he pushes. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's times where you got to push it. And because if that other side knows that you're just looking to settle, then 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 what's their incentive to either improve their offer or, or even come off their offer um, if, if they are even presenting an offer. So there's times where you have to push it. And there's times that. Um, you got to know where you're going to push it. It may not be at the audit or the administrative level procedure stage because it's just going to be a rubber stamp. And unfortunately, you have to go to circuit court. But I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room that litigation is very expensive. And there's other risks that come with uh, litigation other than just straight expenses. And we'll talk about some of right, those we're today. We're going to talk about that. So what our agenda is, um, we're going to talk about audits. Um, and procedures and approaches to audits, because I think we all have our own, but I think we ought to just talk about some best practices in that. We're going to talk about post audits. We're going to talk about what happens if you get a notice of assessment. So initial considerations that you need to, to deal with on that. Um, the forum. Oh, my God. Figure out what forum you're going to, because there's nothing worse than getting trapped in a forum that, oh, surprises. No surprises. And then we're going to talk a little bit, if we have some time, about non-traditional resolution strategies. I also should explain why the two of us are sitting up here. We did this presentation down in Houston for Houston TEI. And Houston TEI's approach is put two really comfortable lounge chairs on stage with a table in the middle and make it look like the McLaughlin Report, for those of you who remember them. So we decided to replicate that because the two of us almost fell asleep on the stage during the course of it. It was early in the morning. And, and but it was nice with a table with coffee and food, and you know, it was, it, was, it was quite a deal. So, with that, let's get started. We're going to talk about audits, and this is kind of where the rubber really meets the road. Um, the plan if you're planning for an audit, when you get the audit notice letter, you're behind the eight ball, you're way too late in the process. The planning for an audit should start probably before you ever file the return. I would be talking about income tax or. or and you should identify the issues long ahead of getting that stuff on the return because you're behind the eight ball otherwise. Um, and the question is, do you have a policy about audits? You should, or your client should have a policy about audits. How do we handle it? How do we handle the auditor? How do we let the guy in the door um, 
when I was in house, we gave them we or, or do you let them, how how far you let them wander? Who has it, who has authority to speak to them? Yeah, to who the are, auditor. Who has the authority to speak to? I mean, where do you let them go? Do you have just an audit room and just kind of? I, I got a bad story when, when I was down in Dallas um, and we were having audits. The, the, the floor with the audit room on it, the uh, washrooms were under construction. And all the doors were locked. You could get off the elevator, but without a pass, you couldn't get into another floor. And so the first day these auditors, they were Illinois auditors too. The first day the Illinois auditors show up, they had a pass to get into the floor that they were on, but that pass didn't work for any other floor. So by about two o'clock in the afternoon, they're like, we don't have a pass for the washroom. And I'm like, oh really? Well, then the audit will be really quick, won't it? <laughs> so, um, fortunately, I knew them and they thought that wasn't funny, but we did get them a pass. Um, yeah, I, the other thing I'll say is obviously a lot of audits are heading to remote um, or desk audits now, and we see that more and more, which can create some challenges. Just uh, I still think there's a lot of value meeting with people face to face, particularly in an audit when there's going to be complex issues or your business is complex. Because what I, um, a couple of points on this, um, I was formerly at the Illinois Attorney General's office, and one of the pieces that the Illinois Department of Revenue went through and is going through, and maybe some of you experienced this, is around 2010, 11, right after that 2008 financial crisis, they forced early retirement on a lot of auditors that had a wealth of experience. And they replaced those auditors with a lot of junior auditors that really just don't understand uh, the complexities and the substance of the taxes that they're auditing or the complexities of the business. Um, you know, jumping ahead, I, I spent also some time in-house at uh, GE Capital and we were leasing business. First thing we did when we sat down with an auditor was we had a, we had a game plan that was mapped out in a PowerPoint slide because leasing is really complex, but even if it were simple and it were simple to the person who was leading that audit from the taxpayer side, you have to remember this auditor may be seeing this business for the first time. So things that are straightforward and simple to the person explaining it may not be to the auditor. So I'm starting with a PowerPoint. I'm laying out the very basics of our business, um, the, the, the types of transactions that we enter into, what generates revenue, what do we tax, what do we don't tax, if it's an indirect tax audit, um, what's our exemption process standard look like, what does our processes look like, what do our systems look like. You're laying all that out in a PowerPoint presentation, giving that auditor something to take home with, with him or her. Right, and when we talk about starting and developing a game plan, the best defense is an offense, unfortunately, unless you're the Chicago Bears. Um, so what you need to do, you need really to start and identify your potential issues. Um, I also have season tickets to the Bears, so that's why well, that one's done. Uh, you need to identify your potential issues. I mean, you know, you, you know when you're preparing a return, be it a, a transaction tax return or income tax return, what are those potential issues out there? And you need to identify those up front. And you've got to also figure out what position you're going to take if those issues pop on an audit. You kind of have to think ahead because thinking on your feet is great, but thinking on your feet with the auditor sitting across the table from you is not necessarily also great. Um, you've got to know where your weaknesses are too. But here's the call you have to make. You know you've got, you know you've got a bad issue. Do you offer it up and send them down a path going in that direction? Or do you hold it and not tell them and see if in fact it's just found. Or do you hold it until the end and throw it in as a sweetener to get something else? That's a policy decision. That's a procedural decision that you should have probably under your belt as a, as a general policy, I would say, in, in a department. Um, are there trade-offs? Do you know that you could trade X for Y? Now, I gotta say, in today's day and age, when I started this, auditors were much more willing to trade than they are today. Most auditors don't want to do that. Most auditors don't want to talk about it because it's not their pay grade. Kick it up, kick it up the food chain, let somebody else give it away. And in some cases, it's got to go all the way over to the legal side so they can say, we didn't give it away, legal gave it away. So, I mean, you, you, you kind, of, kind of have to figure that one out. Um, you also have to evaluate where you're going. Um, you know, what do you want to do? You want to how do you want to resolve the matter? If this is an ongoing issue, you may want to take it way further than if it's a one-time event or it's a one-time mistake in the return and you're trying to talk your way out of it. 
You've got to figure out where you want to go, how far do you want to go. You don't have to tip your hand to the auditor, but you do need to have that in your back pocket. Am I going to take this through an informal conference? Am I going to go to a, a, a tribunal like an L1? Um, am I willing to take it to court? You've got to kind of have that up front and know it because you've got to get management on board for stuff like that. You've got to get supervisors on board for stuff like that because it all, it all costs. It, it costs internal costs. Forget about paying David and I. You've got internal resources to get utilized. So, and, and then let you guys, I want to show our hands. How many of you are way overstaffed and have plenty of internal resources? Okay, this takes time. So you got to have to sort that through. Um, Next. On that? Next slide. Yeah, I mean, in terms of resources, one of the things that I struggled with when I was at um, the Attorney General's office representing the Department of Revenue is the jurisdictions don't always account for the fact that it is costing them resources to litigate these cases as well. And that works against the taxpayer, even though there are co costs associated with it because they have to expend people on those cases. The jurisdictions, at least in my personal experience, don't always recognize that because they don't see dollars. It's not like the, the Department of Revenue is paying the Attorney General to represent them. So that, that works against uh, taxpayers. But what I have found successful, and this and we'll talk about this later, is sometimes you have to get past that audit stage to either the administrative review stage or whatever stage it is when attorneys come in, like the, the attorney general's office, because some a good attorney general or assistant attorney general will rep, will recognize the costs yeah. to, to their client and also to the agency to, to litigate a bad case. But the Department of Revenue at the audit stage will not always do that. So when you're in the process of developing a game plan, that should start long before, as we said earlier, long before the audit starts. And in my opinion, audits fall into two buckets. You have what I would call the normal audit. So what are you looking for? You're looking to see if there's any statutory changes, any regulatory changes that might, you might not have caught. I mean, I, I just filed a protest this morning where somebody just missed a statutory change in Alabama. Now we've got a lot of other issues where we missed the statutory change. We didn't protest that. We just missed it. And as hard as I tried, I couldn't figure out an argument to say, I guess we just missed it. Um, and so you just look for that. But bucket number two is a specific transaction. Income tax side. Did you acquire something? Did you divest of something? Did you, did you restructure something? Sales, same thing on the transaction tax side. Did you move stuff around? Did, have you, what, what's your exemption certificate process look like? Um, Something specific happens that might trigger an, tr trigger an issue. Um, next question, something that I loved when I was in-house. Where is the documentation to support all of this? Have we changed systems? Have we gone to SAP from something else? And where did we put all those invoices? What server are they on? Can any, does anybody know how to use the software or the server that they're on, right? Um, so you kind of have to think through that. And I, my experience in-house is sometimes your IT departments and your other departments who are in control of those things, if they don't touch base with tax, you've got a problem. And you're hunting down stuff that, you know, my least favorite, this obviously I was in-house before we did a lot of stuff electronically, but the worst case of your life is when they bring 15 boxes that have been in storage for, you know, 10 years and you're climbing through dirty boxes to figure out where the contract is. Uh, so the goal would be memorialize the documents someplace, put them in an electronic file, save them so you can find them on a server that you can get into. Um, but the other thing is in bucket two, because it's not your traditional audit, you need to take a step back and you've got, oh, I think I just, I, it works. No, you're good. I was going to say the battery just died. Um, you, you take a step back and figure out, do I need outside help? I'm looking at this and I'm figuring out, man, do, do I need a study on something? Or, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was in-house, um, the question in Texas is whether electric is used in manufacturing. And when we would have a transaction tax audit, because we had refineries now, when we would have a transaction tax audit, the question was how much electric was used. And, and we needed a study every year. I will give you a heads up, depending on the auditor, it would be better to get a study from a, an Aggie engineer than a UT engineer at the auditor went to Texas A&M. Uh, <laughs> Sam's in the back laughing. 
if they went to Texas, you wanted a UT engineer. Uh, but the, the bottom line of this, do you need a study? Um, do you need some sort of consulting help? Because you just, it, it just works that way. Um, so you've got to identify that going in. And do you think you're going to litigate this? Do you want to bring in a law firm? Because that way you can protect some privilege. Maybe you can, you can keep some stuff away from the auditor or get some guidance on that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I know I, I understand maybe um, the difficult or, or the challenges that a company may have of engaging a law firm. They think maybe the law firm just wants to get in there and take over the audit. But uh, if you find the right law firm or the right attorney just to establish some privilege, I think that's pretty, that, not pretty, that's very helpful in an, in an audit when you know that you have some issues that are going to come up. Maybe you've taken a, you know, aggressive position. Do you need to preserve the privilege? Because the last thing you want is documents going, you know, um, to a number of people internally, then you're sharing those. And even if they don't come out and audit and you go to litigate, you know, an issue or the issue, it's going to come out in discovery unless it's privilege. There's also another reason to go maybe outside or at least talk to your peers. Well, you know what issues you may have because you know how you filed your returns or you know what's lurking out there. It does help to find out what other issues are lurking in those states that may impact you. And that is, I mean, you, you, everybody can read the dailies and all the stuff that's about cases that are out there. But there's a lot of stuff lurking around in the background that doesn't get published. And to the extent you go out and talk to somebody, sometimes some inside baseball doesn't hurt anybody. And, and so that there's another there's another benefit sometimes I think of not only talking to your peers but also talking to, to consultants or lawyers because they may know something that you just don't know and before you step in it so to speak at least you know it's coming. Um, so so what we're talking about let me ask you how many people in this room have a procedure for how they handle IDRs? How many? Diane, I knew that. I knew that. Um, how many people would tell their clients? I, mean, I think not having a, it, it's instrumental that you have a procedure for how you handle IDRs. I mean, what type of documents do you turn over? Do you have a procedure for saying what kind of documents you'll actually give them? I mean, will you give them um, the board minutes? Will you give them, you know, the audit, the board, the audit, the board, audit committee reports? I mean, it's, it's important to have those kind of procedures so you know, so you're just not blindsided when they come in and ask for them. Um, how do you handle sensitive information? I mean, there's certainly contracts that are out there that maybe have proprietary information in them. Um, you certainly, I mean, at the audit level, that all is supposed to be confidential. The question is where it goes. We're going to talk a little bit about sharing of information in one of our later slides. But so you need procedure. I mean, I would suggest, strongly suggest, and I, I'd be interested to hear how G, I know how GE handle it, but I'm interested in your opinion on this that you have a procedure for how you handle our IDRs. Everything has to be in writing. You give it to me in writing, I'm gonna respond in writing, unless I'm giving you my, my five foot high federal tax return, in which case I'm handing you that, and with a note saying I gave them the federal tax, I gave them the 1120 on X date. I mean, yeah, I think you know another good game plan for that is, is taking notes of an audit, so then when you get to the next cycle, if you know it's a jurisdiction that's on rinse and repeat, then you're going to see what you did and what you gave the auditor in the last cycle and what you didn't. And I would just, you know, if that worked, I would stick to that. And if they say, well, we need X, Y, and Z, and then you push back, well, we didn't need to give you X, Y, Z last time, and you got through the audit. So um, I think memorializing the audit after the fact is some nice documentation to retain. I also think, I mean, I've had on the income tax side auditors ask for reserve work papers um, or, or reserve memos. And, and my experience has been, and, and when I write a, a reserve memo, I always suggest this. You can have a great big long reserve memo that supports it. I would do an executive summary on top of it. And if you had to turn anything over, these external auditors in the group are gonna hate what I just say, I'm about to say. I would only give the executive summary to my external auditors, and that's all I would ever give to a, a, to a regular state auditor, um, and then have the fight later with the external auditors. Um, it's just to see how much privilege you, you can keep. But another question is, you have auditors that come in and say, I would like to interview that plant manager because I would like to know how the plant works or what the plant does. or how, 
what's your policy on interviews? Will you let them go out and interview an operations guy? And if the answer is yes, will you go with them and, 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 and supervise? I have two things. I have a client that allowed a California income tax auditor to go out and sit with their, the, the, the CFO and one of their operating guys at one of their subsidiaries without any supervision. And then they were nice enough, the auditors, to give us their notes. I was off the charts. Um, you just, that's not great tax, in my, okay, my opinion is that it is not great, um, that's not a way to manage an audit. When I was in-house, we always had auditors that wanted to take a tour of a refinery. I'm not sure why. I've been in a lot of refineries in my life. It's not that exciting. Only rivaled by a chemical plant, which is less exciting. Um, and so but they always want to go to the refinery. So we take them to the refinery. And I honestly think they thought they were going to get out and walk. No way. They're in a bus. They're, and, and they're going around the perimeter, right? Because you're not taking them any place where they can get burned. And, or any, and you're not giving them any Nomax so they don't get burned. Um, and, and so, but all right, you want to, if it makes you happy to say you've been in a refinery, we'll take you on a tour of the refinery, no big deal. We saw nothing, but you know, you got, you got to just, but they would never went on supervised, trust me. Yeah, that reminds me of the story. Interviewing personnel can be very beneficial. Uh, Marilyn and I had a case a handful of years ago with a SAS issue in the city of Chicago. Oh, yeah where um, the auditor, it, even though it was in the controversy stage, it was really an extension of the audit and the auditor and um, her attorney didn't really truly understand the business service that was, that was being um, offered. So what we did there is we found a software engineer or I, I can't even remember exactly what. He was, was a software engineer as well as he, he did some marketing work, so he knew what was going on. Yeah, and, and so we, you know, obviously interviewed that person, spoke with that person, became very comfortable that, you know, at a high level, this individual knew the tax issues, but we didn't want him to go into tax. We didn't want him to say something about tax that would threaten our position. Um, but he was very knowledgeable in the software space, in the SaaS space. And so we, we sat him down with a, for an interview um, with the auditor and the attorney. Uh, we were in the room as well. Um, I, I don't know. This is one of the, the most surprised I've ever been. but we probably had at best a 50 50 settlement on a $6 million issue yeah. and they walked away from the entire issue in, in that case. And, and he was very compelling in, in the, in the room. And he said, this is what we do. Um, whether the, the attorney and the auditor didn't ask the right question, I don't know, but that's, you can use those instances to, to help you to bring that business person in and explain exactly what they do. And it's nice to do that outside of a formal deposition, which now you have testimony um, that's taken under oath. And if something extremely damaging is said for that case or even another case, uh, now that's that's available. Whereas an informal stage, you know, you can hide it can hide it if it if it comes out something and, damaging. And that this guy really did. He 50 50 is good. You know what I mean? This guy talked him out of it. And we went back to the guy's supervisors and you ought to get this. I mean, this guy deserves something because they, they walked from $6 million. And I don't think, I don't, I mean, we well, had, I'm corporate America, nothing, right? I'm sure. But we uh, had another issue in that case that we thought was a 90% winner. <laughs> yeah. We settled that issue so quick and we're like, we'll give you, that was a million dollar issue at best. We'll, we'll, give, we'll, give, we'll give you 50 50 on that one. Let's just close the audit. We closed that out at six years and uh, thought we got out, but we did. We, we got out temporarily. So, we're going to do the next slide or we'll never get out of this. Um, let's talk about inadvertent admissions. I think in most audits, somebody has probably designated the party in your firm or your consulting firm to say, I'm the one that's going to handle the audit. I'm the go-to person. I would have one or two designated people. You've got to really be careful who gets to talk to an auditor because you can say things inadvertently. You know, it, it just... You don't want out there. So I would always limit who interacts with an auditor. And you might want to have a discussion with your business people or your operations people just to make sure that if questions are asked, they come to you before they go someplace else. Um, you can have informal settlement discussions with an auditor. I would be careful what I say with them. I would make sure that I said, hey, you know, it's an opportunity to settle this. I could couch it. 
because sometimes they can come back and bite you. Um, and you really don't want something used against you if you don't have to. Um, you may be careful who you speak with in the department. Um, because I will tell you there are, and more so today than there were maybe 10 years ago, very strict lobbying laws. For example, I think you are a lobbyist. If you pick up the phone and call Director Harris in Illinois and want to talk about a specific case, I think you're lobbying. Now, I don't know if they call you on it, but I think under, under the, the Illinois lobby law, you probably have fallen into a lobby. So, and, and, and the other state statutes are all kind of across the board. I mean, I know I've got a friend who works for a lobbying firm who said to me, if you ever have a question, just call me up because we've got a database. But you can, so talking to an auditor, no. But when you go with the food chain, you need to be careful because you really don't want to get caught. If you're not registered, you really don't want to be caught. I mean, there were a lot of emails disclosed for the city of Chicago where people got caught talking to the former mayor um, on stuff that, you know, they really weren't registered lobbyists. So you don't just need that. Um, the other thing I think, statute of limitations are obviously sensitive. And I think most companies or most people should have some sort of policy on waivers. I have one client that has a policy we never give waivers. Mm. One of them heartburn for their audit people. That's one of them. Because everybody in this room knows sometimes you can't get the audit done for whatever reason, timely. Sometimes. If you, beg, <laughs> if you have to go beg for a waiver from management, that's not great. So I think you need some flexibility. I am also not encouraging that you let them have eight years to finish an audit because, because. Um, so I, 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 you, you kind of need a, a policy on waivers. I also think you need to be sensitivity to expiration dates. I mean, if you're on a routine audit, I've had, I've had, section, I've had periods drop, no question. But if you're on a routine audit cycle with a state, there's a, there's a push pull or there's tension between do I tell them they're going to drop a quarter or they're going to drop a period versus they're going to come in, this same guy is coming back in to audit me for the next audit cycle. And if he loses a year or he loses six months, oh man, that next audit's not going to go well. I mean, so I think you really have to figure out from a business perspective, sometimes it pays, I mean, it, it, look, it always pays to be nice to the auditor. It does pay to cooperate a little bit. I mean, so you've got to figure, you've got to figure that out. The other thing that's key, at least on the income tax side, where are you on federal waivers? Because a number of, a lot of states, if you're open for federal, you're open for state. And most states will ask you for a waiver anyway, because they just don't want to have to track the federal waiver. California's like that. They just don't want to have to track the federal waivers. Alaska's like that. But if you're open for federal, if you're open for state, even if you deny them the state waiver, you haven't accomplished anything, you're still there. Um, I don't, at the federal level, you can have limited waivers. You can have them limited to a specific uh, company. You can have them limited to a specific transaction, like you got a partnership transaction that's under audit, you won't get a waiver for that. You kind of need to be careful with those because in a number of states, that will hold the whole statute open. And in some states, it will not. Okay, that did not sound good. <laughs> we, we just lost a lot of dishes. Um, but, it, it, but I will also tell you it'll work to your advantage. I had a case in California where we had about a million dollar refund that could have been out of statute, but the company had a limited waiver for a foreign tax credit issue that had absolutely nothing to do with California. And Went to the franchise tax board and they said, oh yeah, that'll hold it open. And they gave us a million bucks. So it cuts both ways. Um, but you need to be careful about statutes of limitations and, and waivers. Yeah, I think we're going to see some statute of limitations and oh. issues in the years that come just due to everything that happened during COVID and how there, there was emergency regulations and government orders. Um, we've seen some issues. There's some case... Um, is that Pennsylvania? It was an Ohio case, I think. There were a number of states. California did it. New York did it. New Jersey's got a problem right now with waivers, where where they the, by governor by the governor's proclamation, effectively, yeah. they suspended the statute of limitations for six or eight months, 
And so those cases have not percolated up to the top yet. So it's possible there's an extra six or eight months on some of your statutes that you don't know about. Um, so, go ahead. You go ahead. Mar Marilyn's uh, leading all the slides on the front end. So it's get, she's getting a little, uh, we're almost there. We're almost You're almost there. there. We're almost there. Um, it, I mean, we talk about when you prepare for an audit. We said earlier, both of us, David and I did it. You kind of have to identify your key issues. You know what you have. You may have it in one state, you may have it across the board, but you need to know what your key issues are well in advance of the audit. And you also need to evaluate what you're going to do with those issues. You're going to litigate them, you're going to try to settle them. You also have to be careful, this is going to go more into what David's going to talk about in a second. When you're evaluating them, if I can see something in one state, you know, there's not no money in it. I got a $20,000 issue, and I, and I know I'm not litigating that. But in state B, that $20,000 issue is a $20 million issue. You may not want to consider. I mean, you, you, you've got to evaluate what the impact is across the board. I mean, I, we have that right now in my business income case that we've not litigated. We have a very small issue in Michigan. We have a very large issue in Alaska. Um, yeah, that was the same thing I was going to say or, or similar to it, that, you know, these auditors uh, talk, whether it's at the MTC or... Um, yeah. Other revenue, uh, not revenue sharing agreements, but just the word gets around. And, and also, you know, FOIA is becoming a much more common technique, even in state tax and tax in general. And who's to say that there's not jurisdictions using FOIA, util, utilizing FOIA in other states to figure out, you know, what issues are, are bubbling up? I mean, if you had asked me five years ago whether FOIA was being used for tax issues, I, I'd say, oh, yeah. you know, no way. But I think back to, you know, even when I was at the attorney general's office in Illinois and acted a new FOIA law, it, back in 2011, the Department of Revenue stopped putting, uh, they refused to put confidentiality provisions in the settlement agreements. And that's really picked up across the country uh, three or four years ago. Maybe it was even more than that because yeah. COVID kind of got in the way. Um, uh, there was a news publication that went after a number of settlement agreements in the city of Chicago and the city, uh, you know, at least to, to their benefit, they came to us because some of our clients were impacted and they said, Hey, we received this FOIA request. We're going to give these settlement agreements away because we think we have to, you know, do you have a problem with this? Well, of course the, the, the taxpayer had a problem with it. We had a problem with it. We fought it, but it got to the point where the city said, we're going to disclose these unless you file suit in circuit court and stop us because the, the FOIA laws really favor disclosure because if you don't disclose it and then it ultimately gets litigated at the circuit court and it finds out that you should have disclosed it, there's, there's um, attorney's fees and all kinds of other punitive damages that the non-disclosing party had to pay. So ultimately, the city of Chicago, uh, in th this news organization, pushed them to it and they issued all these settlement agreements. I think there was 30 or so and then wrote a, an article and, and names and amounts and everything were, were disclosed. I mean, the, David brought up the MTC. I was at the MTC's annual meeting last week and on Monday it was closed to anybody that wasn't, I mean, the rest of it, the rest of the week was fine, but on Monday it was closed to anybody who was not a state but it was a person. And it was pretty much limited to the attorneys from those states. And they had an all-day training session translated. They have a. They sat there and talked about issues that are out there that they're experiencing that Alaska may have. That you know that they trade with California or California may have and trade with Montana. There's about 30 MTC members right now between associate and, and full members. They sat there on Monday and talked about issues. Now I don't know whether there are, there's, there are a couple of friends of mine that were in that meeting. I don't know whether they actually name taxpayers' names, but I do know some states will. I know Montana will. So um, there is a trade here, guys. And you just need to, I mean, just those of those people in this room who have been to the cost audit sessions, they know exactly what goes on. People talk about issues. The states do too. And so you just need, need to be aware of that um, with respect to that. I guess we should move on to settlements. Um, Man, just managing a stalled audit. I, I'll say quickly, you just need a policy for this. Sometimes it's good to let it just stall and maybe they will never come back. And the statute's gone. I mean, you, you gotta have some, you should have some kind of thought process about how 
you're going to handle it. Um, and it, it, right? I mean, yeah. Does anyone have a success story where maybe an auditor was knocking on their door, they had a big issue, and then the auditor kind of went away? And um, I, I don't need you to share the story. Just say yes or no. I just want to give out swag. That's all. Oof. So, a, re a retroactive waiver they, they can't do. The other one literally happens to finish writing it. The auditor comes in and says, I want to do this. Why did you, um, just out of curiosity, reach out to the auditor? Just because you just never thought it would well, drop? It's that data. Uh, it's that data. Well, like, it's taking so long to get back. And the client was like, are we going to wrap this up? And I think COVID is going yeah. to, there's a lot of stall audits because of COVID. And, and, I, and it, because it, first six months, the states didn't really know how to operate remotely. So there's some of that issue. There's some where auditors just disappear. I mean. Right. Oh, that's great. That's great. I mean, I, I, I think you may be able to play that game a little bit, you know, with COVID. Um, but I, I, I really do. I think, it, I think that kind of stuff is good to know. But I really do think you need to have some sort of idea about how you want to handle it rather than just kind of wing it. Um, moving on to settlements. I think you have to ask yourself what level do you want to bring this up? I mean, my theory always is you keep talking until they stop listening. But, <laughs> and sometimes they stop listening real early. But um, some auditors, most auditors these days, I don't think have the authority to settle. But, you know, at what level does it happen? When do you want to make a settlement offer? I mean, the pros of trying to settle at the audit level are, you know, any undetected issues go away. Um, the cons are you may be putting more on the table than you want to, I think, at times. Um, yeah, yeah, I found more recently that I've, uh, in, our, in some of the cases I've worked, having more success once that attorney gets involved past yeah. the audit stage. Um, Except if you're talking about the Cook County Department of Revenue. Oh, that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, that's we a, won't get into that that's one That's a today. whole presentation unto itself. Um, I mean, you, you, you gotta, wait, you, let's just stop. Has anyone dealt with the Cook County Department of Revenue? Just out of curiosity. Besides the two sitting up here? I will tell you. Hopefully no one's listening. It's terrible. <laughs> it is absolutely terrible. I mean, you can only imagine it's bad. It, it's bad. And, and the, I should probably stop, but the attorneys that represent them are even worse. That's all I'll say. I, I would not wish it on my worst enemy. Um, you may want to settle, depending on how many dollars at stake. I mean, you got to do a cost-benefit analysis. Is it worth settling if it's small dollars? I mean, the, you trade off IRS issues for small dollars. I mean, so what, what's the dollars at stake? Um, the con, another con of settling, however, is if this is an ongoing issue, you can close it for one year, but if it's going to, you know, it's like whack-a-mole, it's going to pop up the next year, maybe you want to go further than a settlement. Or, or potentially, although this is hard, to say, look, we're going to settle it for X. We're going to come up with a methodology and we're going to utilize that methodology on all forward years until such time as the law changes, our facts change, and draft that up in a settlement agreement, in writing. Do not do a handshake, but in writing, draft something like that up. I mean, that's one way. We're going. Yeah, you know, something else that we didn't talk about earlier, but something that just triggered with settlement in writing is anytime you can get an auditor to make an admission, um, or something that's going to be favorable, or maybe that you think this auditor is maybe 
I don't know, not that you're catching them in, in a misstatement, but um, anytime that they're willing to agree to an issue, you get that in writing. Do anything in your power to get that yeah. in writing. Right. If they, if they can see something that the course of the audit, get it in the audit work papers, get something that will help you. I mean, um, so another thing, I mean, do you have a policy or procedure with respect to when, I mean, that would help too, if you have a policy or procedure with respect to when you'll approach a settlement. Um, some of the times settling helps, or at least discussing it helps, because you might get an idea of what the state's position is, because sometimes an auditor is being told to do something and you have no idea what the basis of what they're asking. I just read an entire Alabama audit report, and for the life of me, I have no idea why they issued the assessment. It makes no sense. Um, so maybe having a conversation with them would help. But, you know, it, so the question is, settling sometimes can, can kind of enlighten you, if, if, if nothing else. Question is, is there a form of settlement process? California, in my opinion, has a great settlement bureau on the FT side, on the income tax side. You can take a case there, it's done in nine months. If it doesn't work, you go back to the other side. But at least you can sit in a room, talk to people, people will discuss the issues. And if it's a one off issue, it's not good, it, it, it will not, it will not, ongoing, ongoing issues, it will not resolve. But if it's a one off issue, it's a great and efficient way to get something put to bed. And it's a lot quicker than going the other route. Yeah, yeah, there's some other programs. I think in theory, uh, the theory works really well. And, and California is an example where I know that Maryland's had some success. Um, Jordan and I had one in Massachusetts where I think the law states that you have to make significant concessions. Yeah. Right? Is it You have to, in order to go to that Massachusetts mediation, each party has to be willing to make significant concessions. We went there and I don't think they made even a concession, let alone. Yeah, I, um, Chris and I did something similar in DC. We went through a mediation where the, the mediating judge uh, had zero tax experience. He, maybe he was a former litigator and had mediation experience. So that wasn't helpful. So, but I think the theory works if you get mediation because a good mediator is going to force the department to recognize some of the risks that they have and, and also like avoid some of these costs of, of litigating. I went through a mediation process when I was in house. and We went out and hired an outside mediator to do it. It was, a low, it was the city of Torrance in California over a boiler fuel issue. I mean, it's an esoteric issue. But we had a retired appellate, California appellate court judge as our mediator. And we both briefed it and we sat there and talked to them. And it did give the city of Torrance an idea that their case wasn't as strong as they thought it was. Now we had a lot of money on the line, so it's not, it's not an inexpensive process. But it is something to explore if you wanna go outside and then see if you can get a third party media. But the MTC also has a mediation program. However, it's generally when two states are pitted against each other for the same issue, like they claim something to be business, non-business income and two states are saying it's non-business income. Um, I don't know anybody that's ever used it, but there is a program out there. Um, when we talk about closing agreements, this is key. Don't do anything that's not in writing. I mean, the key is to get it in writing. The key is to get as many terms in that written agreement as you possibly can. If it's an income tax case, get the apportionment formula numbers in the agreement because you may not have filed your federal audit adjustments yet. It's nice to know what you're apportioning on, so you're not arguing about numbers. Um, it, so the key is to get it in writing, um, have something in there, how you're gonna handle NOLs. How are you gonna handle credits if it's, if it's an income tax case? How are you gonna handle RERs? Um, question is whether or not you can keep it confidential. If it's an MTC state, regardless of whether it's transaction tax or income tax, if it's an MTC state, they will not put a confidentiality clause in generally because by their charter, MTC's compact, they can share information with all their member states. So it's very unlikely. Illinois has a real problem with the confidentiality because we changed, you would know this because I think it was when you were the AG's office. We changed our, I won't say it's transparency, but we changed our confidentiality. We changed some statute. When Lisa Madigan was attorney general, yeah. you couldn't get a confidentiality clause in anything. Um, so some statute changed. Yeah, that. yeah, no, it was a FOIA statute. They permit the disclosure of settlement agreements, but that was aimed primarily due to 
uh, you know, other issues that were happening with, with uh, our former governor, Blagojevich, uh, and some oh, of those right. issues. When he was charging people, yeah. <laughs> I thought there was a Senate seat. Well, the other um, thing with, with settling, um, rolling those issues forward, this, uh, this happened all the time in a former life when I was in-house. We would, you know, get to an audit result, whether that was settled or not, we roll that forward. If it's something that you can live with, why go through the expense, you know, two years later on another audit cycle, if you can just live with that result and roll it forward. Um, you know, some, there's operational deficiencies sometimes, uh, particularly on the indirect side where you just know, maybe you're not gonna be able to fix that in the next two or three years. Why do I need an auditor to come here and go through another audit? We know we're gonna, you know, have these issues or we're just such a large organization. We know that we're gonna miss stuff. I mean, no one is 100% tax compliant. At least I don't think so, but. If you're 100% tax compliant, you've got too much time on your hands, or you're very, very small. I don't know which. Um, so I, I think the, the key up here is understand the information sharing provisions. Most states, there's a provision, every state has, has a sharing agreement with every other state and the IRS will share as well. However, in the way it generally works is there's one information office for each state, and that is the party to whom they are supposed to apply and ask for the information. Okay, that's in theory. In practice, just like last Monday in Anchorage at the MTC meeting, they are all sitting in a room sharing information. I know it. And so it's a, so now we have the official trivia. So, all right, so. You have to sing this. I have no way, because when I was in grade school and high school, the nuns told me to stand in the back and mouth it. Um, if you drive a car, I'll tax the street. If you try to sit, I'll tax your seat. If you get too, too cold, I'll tax the heat. If you take a walk, I'll tax your feet. Which band released this song called Tax Band? And which member of the band wrote it? Half of that's right. Yeah. We'll still go. The man gets half. So who knows, does anybody know who wrote Tax Band for, in the Beatles? No, no, no. Well, we're down two. We're down, we got two more. <laughs> Good job, Harrison. Who said Harrison? Right here, Harrison. Okay, okay now to David's face. Yeah, so it's like I said, Marilyn uh, always likes to push back uh, or resist the litigation. So just like this presentation, she took the first 50 minutes and then leave me with 10 minutes to I, talk I about. I don't like to push back, but <laughs> I'd like to be realistic about it. Let's go with that. Uh, I say that in jest, but it, it, in all honesty, uh, oftentimes I, I don't think I enjoy this, but I do it because I think it's in the client's best interest. But you... It's, it's good to work with colleagues, and this is in any context, whether it's in the law firm or in in-house, where you know you are really collaborating and do that, you have to push back on, on the person that you're working with and present alternative views. And so, uh, you know, I, like I said, I work with Marilyn, I work with all, uh, all the uh, colleagues that are here, and I think that's really beneficial to work with those types of people where you can have those conversations where you're pushing back on it and, you know, just alternatively thinking and critically thinking about it um, and, and, you know, not take anything personal. I think that's where you generate a lot of success and collaboration, but it's kind of a sidebar. Um, but, uh, okay, so here we go. We've now surpassed the, oh, and I lost my computer, so I don't know exactly where we are. Um, so we're past the audit stage and now we've been issued with the notices of assessment. So one of the things that jurisdictions love to do, um, particularly their attorneys, is stand on the ground that their notice of assessment is deemed to be prima facie correct. And that we see this all the time in litigation. They walk into court and say, judge, you know, we don't even have to prove anything because our notice is prima facie correct. Here it is. Taxpayer owes $12 million. Let's slam it down doesn't care how bad our audit was and they walk out the door and then they put it all on the taxpayer. I will say that we have pushed back on this position yeah. um, more and more recently, particularly in Illinois. Um, there's been some success stories out there. There's some, there's some decent, I'd say even good Illinois case law, Supreme Court precedent, where it talks about the audit has to meet a standard of reasonableness. It can't just be the auditor went in there, looked at its business, thought they found a $10 million issue, slapped it down on an assessment, and that's it. There has to be some reasonableness associated with the 
uh, the analysis, the methods, and the assumptions that the auditor is making. So um, we recently presented this issue um, and we got a really favorable decision. It, 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 we lost at the, at the county level, but then it was appealed up to the circuit court. Um, it is a public decision, so I would love everyone to, to read it. Um, it's a 74 page decision kicking the county in the, you know what? Um, county Department of Revenue. Yeah, it, but one of the issues the judges, the, the, the circuit court judge gave merit to was like, look, the auditor was like asleep at the wheel when they conducted this. Like the taxpayer was giving them documentation and information. The auditor just looked at it, didn't care and looked the other way. When you said the sky was blue, they would say it's white. When you said it's white, they'd say it's blue. Like it, he just took the opposite position every time. And But there's some really good case law. So I say this because yes, there is the fear that when you go into appeals that you're going to have the burden as the taxpayer. But just know that you, you have... You know, and this even goes outside Illinois. There's case law outside Illinois. They have to meet that standard of, of reasonableness. We're arguing that in the Alaska case, the two of us are litigating, where the auditor didn't look at any of the documents, but he looked at a lot of dollars. And that's, you know, we got the assessment, but it would have been nice if you read the contract. Yeah, and another issue that's kind of related is when the auditors take a position that is really outside of, they have no regulation or statutory support for it, uh, there's some good uh, case law on stealth regulation. So if the department has maybe taken a position in the past, but it wasn't published, uh, you, you hear the term um, stealth regulation, meaning, you know, it's behind the scenes, this is the department policy, but it's not out and known for, for the taxpayer. There's some favorable tax there or some case law case on that as well. In the circuit court of the county and the tobacco tax. Um, all right, so notice of assessment, what are your options? So you always have options, right? You get that notice of assessment. Maybe you just want to concede and pay the assessment. And there's benefits to that. Maybe it's due to dollar amount. Maybe you want to stay out of the paper. Maybe, you know, it's a small issue in the state that you receive the assessment. You don't want to wake up another state where it's going to be a large issue. Um, maybe you want to pay it to stop. Well, we're going to get into this, but maybe we won't pay it to stop the interest and then file a refund claim. Maybe you want to pay it. You don't know if you're going to fight it yet. Maybe that refund claim permits you an additional statute. Maybe you have, you know, one year, two years, three years to, to file a claim after making the payment. So it's going to give you a little bit more time to decide. Um, maybe alternatively, um, well, the other one is, is prepare and timely file a protest. That's where you're contesting it. The big thing to remember there is you have to do it timely. And jurisdictions across the board are going to have different requirements. Back to my Cook County example and how wonderful they are. Cook County of 20 days, 20 days from the date of the assessment. And they are notorious for dating it on a Thursday, letting it sit around on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sending it out to Monday to an office that they've never dealt with. And then all of a sudden you find the assessment. You have two days to protest it if you're lucky. Now, the good news is with a lot of these protests, Cook County or other jurisdictions, you can name a number. Oftentimes, the, the most important thing to do is just get something on file. And then you just, you, you, you know, provide yourself with a safety net that says you reserve the right to, to later refile or not refile, but amend your protest to add or supplement facts and arguments. But the big thing is you have to get that on file. Once you blow that date, with the exception of, I think, the city of Chicago, right, has an exception. Right. Sam, we've talked about this, where you, you just have to pay. Yeah. But, but, Certain but, issues. But David and I had the privilege at the county to write a brief on how to count to 20 to prove that our protest was filed in 20 days. The question is whether Explain it started on the client. Whether, well, I didn't brief to count to 20. Whether day one was the date that it was dated or whether it started the next, next day. day. That was a fun one to argue. Uh, uh, and then there's other options, you know, uh, Illinois is one example, right? You can, if, if the matter, you can take the matter to the Illinois tribunal if it's over a certain dollar threshold or alternatively, and this used to be the primary option is you can, you know, uh, pay to play you can file that under protest. And, uh, I, this is on a later slide, but we're so limited in time. So I'll just talk about it now, but there's strategic advantages to that. And, um, you know, a number of the partners that are sitting in this uh, room from HMB when I was at the AG's office used to file protests down in Springfield and I would litigate against them. 
it, but oftentimes they would just file them down in Springfield and park it. So in Cook County, as an example, Cook County, you file a, a protest matter and they're going to keep that they're, they're going to keep that rolling. You know, you're going to have status updates. The judge is going to push it along. If you file in Sangamon County, I think Maryland might have cases that she filed when I was there in 2010 that are still pending. Oh, but I only filed, I filed down there for two reasons. One, because I'd like to litigate against David. Um, <laughs> it's not my partner. But two, the judges down there are much nicer. And in all honesty, so are the assistant attorney generals down there, much easier to deal with. So that's why I would go down. Yeah, I would say as a taxpayer, I you know, when we talk about this later too, like know your venue and your forum, I'd say as a taxpayer, if you are going to pay to play, I would never advise someone to file in Cook County. No. I mean, m maybe there would be a set of facts where it would make sense, but it is a little bit more uh, business tax friendly in, in Sangamon County as well. And and you're going to get some judges that uh, have some tax experience. Judge Bells was was a, a, a great judge. I don't know if he's still hearing any tax cases, but... And, and where can you get a judge that when you're down there for the night, the guy will tell you where to go out to dinner? This is a good restaurant. And the other one told me how to get home from Chicago to get avoid the, uh, the because I-55 was all torn up. So he's like, you go this way. I mean, you don't get that out of a Cook County judge. You know, these guys are really very nice. All right. So initial considerations, non-tax. We talked about this. Um, you know, are there considerations outside of the tax dollar? Number one is how to address the media or, or publicity issues. So um, previously worked at, at GE, and there's a couple of my former colleagues, and they can all attest to this. GE said, stay out of the paper. We don't want our name in the paper. And, and you know, filing a, a litigation in a public forum, you run the risk that your name's going to be out there. How does that impact your stock? Now, there's probably not too many state tax issues that are that are really going to impact the, the, the dollar value of, you know, of a large company that's being identified in the in the Wall Street Journal. But there's other risks associated with that. Um, you know, there's a number of large companies right now who are identified as never paying any corporate income tax. And, and that was the thing with GE. They were always in the Wall Street Journal for never paying corporate income tax. Well, it, it never you also got to be careful. It, it's dollars. You will make the paper if you have a lot of commas in the assessment. But the other side of it is, if you're publicly traded, you need to be careful about, does this need to be a footnote in the financials? Is it more than a footnote in the financials? Um, and, you know, there are people up the food chain that are not happy about that. So you, you, you really do have to be careful all the way to go. Yeah, we're about out of time. I'm trying to, um, anything major uh just a little bit quick difference is if you take it uh by means of an administrative tribunal uh there might just be different rules of evidence it might be more lax in terms of 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 what how how the procedure works out but there could be advantages of you know sometimes you'll take a matter to administrative level and you know that it's just an extension of the department of revenue and you're going to lose that matter so if you have the option to skip ahead to circuit court is that something you consider maybe maybe not for one by heading through the administrative level it kind of gives you a preview of what the department's arguments are going to be it also gives you some time to formulate strength in your own arguments and even though you know maybe you're going to lose at that level uh, it, it's just kind of like a precursor, like it, it gives you time to prep for, for when you really need to make those arguments at the circuit court. Okay. It also opens the door to settlement, potentially. It opens the door to settlement. The one thing you have to be careful of when you go to the administrative level is that where you have to make the record. Because if, even though they may have looser rules of evidence, if that's where you have to make the record, man, you need to be going and prepared for that. You need to have, make sure that you have witnesses. I mean, David and I have done now two eight-day trials, I've done actually three of them, you do two of them with me, eight-day trials on, on administrative hearings with Cook County. We had nine witnesses in each one of those. So, I mean, you've got to be, that's where we had to make our record. So, you need, you need really to be careful if you're going to jump into that forum, what's, what's going to happen. Any closing comments? No, because Chris is walking up here, so I think he's going to take our mics. Okay. Yeah. Um, We'll be around if anyone has questions, come find us, but thanks for uh, being attentive and, and joining us today.